Um, so uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to come here. Um, thanks to the organizers. Uh, I'm at the Danforth Plant Science Center, as James mentioned, and I, I realize many people may not know about the Danforth, maybe never heard of it. So the Danforth Plant Science Center is based in St. Louis, and it's the, the world's largest independent nonprofit plant science institute. And um, actually right now, only we, we have, this is the main building. This is actually being built right now, and they're only up to the second floor. But this cam the campus of Danforth is, I think, conceptually similar to what you're trying to actually do here. So there, you know, there's the science component, the big greenhouse ranges, but there's also a, a, an incubator that houses about 20 companies. So the Danforth has a really strong uh, industrial outreach or a, a commercialization um, a bent to it. Within a quarter mile, there's another incubator that has about 20 companies as well. And across the street, right over here, is uh, the world headquarters for Monsanto. So there's a lot of plant science going on in St. Louis. Um, so I'm going to, uh, to tell you a, a kind of a few stories. So a short, a, a, a short sort of introduction will be on the, the big data aspect of, uh, of genomics and plant genomics. Um, and then I'll get into high throughput controlled environment phenotyping that we've pursued at the Danforth and also talk about kind of uh, looking forward what's going to be happening or could be reasonably projected to happen with field phenotyping in the next few years. Um, now if I was invited to give this talk uh, six years ago, I probably would have started here and talked about, as we've heard a, a few different speakers have talked about the, the big data challenges associated with sequencing. And, so six years ago, <clears throat> it was a more acute problem. So with technologies like this Illumina platform had been uh, and, uh, and other platforms uh, developed and commercialized that generated unprecedented amount of, amounts of sequence, uh, that just storing data was a problem. And uh, there were no or very few tools, so software tools and algorithms developed at that point. It was kind of like a free for all and a, a very challenging situation. What's happened in the last six years, the, the prices have plummeted dramatically, as we've heard a few people mention, so that now sequencing per se isn't necessarily a bottleneck. It's still expensive. You know, we're not all, we're all resource limited to some extent, but it's relatively cheap compared to uh, uh, historically. And the whole landscape of bioinformatics and genomics have changed in that there, there's an enormous community of developers creating software, there are commercial options, there are free, freeware, open source, and so on, so that for pretty much any application you can conceive of to use uh, high throughput sequencing data, there are tools available for genome assembly, transcriptome analysis, variation analysis. So what this is essentially done, this whole mature community and, and software infrastructure has enabled uh, what I call a genome-enabled plant systems. So <clears throat> now in, the, in plant biology, we're not just limited to like one or a couple uh, really well-developed model systems. You can fairly easily develop a, a system into a, a quasi-model uh, just using all the available sequencing technologies. So even though there are still big data ap uh, aspects of, of genomics, uh, I don't really see that as, as a major um, bottleneck anymore. Um, I'll just show you here one example of how we take it in my group, we take advantage of this, this kind of platform or, or uh, infrastructure driven by high throughput sequencing. So th what this cartoon represents is a, it's a, it's a rendition or a, 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 a way to view uh, global gene regulatory network in, in a model grass called Brachypodium. So we have the, the brachypodium genome, thanks to technologies like high throughput sequencing, and we can do expression profiling easily under a variety of conditions and start to and model how genes interact with each other in, and form networks that regulate development and responses to, to uh, the environment. And so this is an example of some of our work published earlier this year where we've defined the gene regulatory network in, in Brachypodium, but also used all those other tools that I, I showed on the previous slide to kind of mark that up and label which networks or subnetworks are involved in different processes like growth control, uh, responses to different stresses or environmental conditions and so on. And this is kind of a, what I just call a, a hypothesis generating exercise. It's really informative, but more importantly, it allows us to nominate candidate genes for further study. So I'll, I would never be able to find them exactly in here, but what we've done out of this 
this network of thousands of genes is we've made hypotheses about a, a pretty much a relative handful, about a, less than a dozen genes that we think are key regulators of stress and photosynthesis, and now we're pursuing, pursuing those in genetic experiments. So all that sequencing technology sets the stage for doing these kinds of studies. But the rest of what I'm going to talk about really relates to what uh, I'm showing here. So the, the bottleneck has shifted. Like we, it's no longer that difficult or uh, uh, expensive to generate omics data, so sequence-based omics data. But one case where it's still a, a, a typically very labor-intensive and challenging is in phenotyping. So phenotyping could be defined lots of ways, but you could think of it simply, if you're not a plant biologist, uh, understanding the, the morphology or growth characteristics or, or even gene expression can be a, an example of a molecular phenotype. Um, and a lot of those phenotypes are very cumbersome or low throughput or labor intensive to acquire. So imagine uh, having a, a bunch of undergrads or, or grad students, whoever, uh, 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 faculty measuring thousands of plants with a ruler. That's low throughput, imprecise, prone to error, uh, not going to be a good <clears throat> approach. Or this is an example of somebody out in the field using, uh, carrying around a heavy device to methodically measure photosynthesis of individual plants. And you, know, you can imagine it might take this guy's lifetime to, to phenotype all those, the wheat plants or whatever those are in that field. It's just not going to happen. So we really need to have high throughput approaches to phenotyping or phenomics. And so that's what I'm going to talk about next. So I'm going to tell you about the efforts at the Danforth uh, focused on high throughput phenotyping, uh, in, in particular in controlled environment conditions. Um, so, uh, in the last few years, there's been the advent of a, a number of high throughput phenotyping approaches and technologies, and they kind of boil down to a few different uh, um, te technological approaches. So, visible light imaging, fluorescent, uh, fluorescent imaging specifically for photosynthesis, uh, near infrared imaging to look at water content in plant tissues. There are also other less developed approaches like hyperspectral, multispectral. Uh, LIDAR or time of flight imaging, which is sort of like the way uh, uh, Microsoft Connect works. Uh, it's a different kind of imaging technology. Um, so a variety of researchers worldwide have, have pursued some of these approaches, and, uh, but it's really been in, in its infancy, and, and especially from a commercial uh, perspective, not readily uh, available or extremely expensive. Um, so I'm going to tell you uh, and show you data <coughs> generated at the Danforth so the Danforth inve invested in uh, a technology that I think a lot of you here are, are familiar with, uh, uh, the Lemnitech platform. So Lemnitech is a German company that makes high throughput phenotyping technologies. And what we did, decided to do at the Danforth was to install the Lemnitech system inside of a giant walk-in growth chamber so we could really precisely control the environment. At the time this was installed, and I actually don't know if this is still true, but at the time this system was built about a year and a half ago, it was the only non-commercial uh, high throughput phenotyping facility in the United States. Um, that may have changed at this point. The, the ag companies have these kinds of technologies deployed. So the, the phenotyping facility at the Danforth comprises this really large, about 800 square foot uh, growth room. It's a giant walk-in chamber that provides precise uh, control of temperature, humidity, light, uh, and uh, plants are grown on a conveyor system, which is the, the, depicted down in this cartoon here, and one by one they traverse through a set of imaging chambers. So they go through these boxes up here, and they're first image, imaged for, uh, uh, through fluorescence imaging for photo, uh, photosynthetic parameters, and then visible imaging in three dimensions to uh, enable three-dimensional reconstruction of the plant structure, and then near-infrared imaging uh, for water content, uh, and it's particularly potentially useful for abiotic stresses like drought stress. Um, now I'm gonna, uh, I did have a video I wanted to show, but I'm not able to uh, play it. it. It just kind of in a neat way shows plants going through the whole system. Um, I w I'd like to actually stop for a minute and, uh, or pause to say that uh, like what happened in the early days of high throughput sequencing. So the very early days of high throughput sequencing, and maybe some of you experienced this, uh, the first generation, for example, of Illumina machines were just junk. You know, you spend $600,000, buy something, and it wouldn't work for like a year. 
and uh, it was very frustrating. And the Lemon Tech, I'd say, was better than that, but for the first six months. So we spent almost $4 million on the system, and for the first six months, it was almost impossible to acquire data. It would break down, components would fail, you'd be running an experiment and think it was your, you know, home free, and in the middle of the night, one of the robotic waterers would knock all the plants off the con conveyors. I mean, they're really crazy stuff like that, but we had to, so we had to work through all those growing pains. And my warning to, you know, like here, you're gonna get a lemon attack, and just expect there's going to be these growing pains for a lot of reasons. It's not a super mature technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they would never agree to that, but they've heard so many complaints from us and others. They, it, it's, the thing is, I'm not really knocking them when I say that. Every single in time they install something, it's a custom installation. No two systems are the same. So th there's bound to be problems, and it's extremely complicated. There must be like 50,000 moving parts. I mean, it's really a complicated system, so there will be problems. Um, okay, now to move on to <clears throat> what we've done. So. In the la so say for the first six months, nothing really happened. And over the last year, the system's been working really well in production mode. And so we've imaged lots of plants, uh, uh, generated hundreds of thousands, actually, uh, yeah, uh, it's mil millions of, of indiv individual images. We've done experiments on a number of, of plant systems. Uh, a few stand out, so really like workhorse model plant systems that are of interest at the center. Uh, we've generated a lot of data on those. Um, if I uh, move on, I'll explain a little bit more about the, the Lemnitec and the challenges we've had. So the system, of course, comes with software. It has fantastic software that runs the system, so all the conveyors and the timing of imaging and all that, but the image analytics are pretty much a black box. And it's, uh, it generates results and data, but it's really hard to know what's hap actually happening analytically. So what we decided to do at the Danforth was to essentially uh, reverse engineer, uh, uh, starting with the database, uh, reverse engineering the database, and then developing a series of software tools. Um, so the first one is called the Fino Front Web Service, which enables the user to easily acquire their own data off the system. Otherwise, it was pretty much locked down and difficult to, to get to. So that's the first component. We developed software to. Uh, um, to, to handle accessing the data, um, and then some machine learning uh, software to uh, actually extract the images of the plant from all the other images. So I'll show you later, or actually you can see it, at, here's an example. The imaging captures a lot of useless information like the holders and the pots and things like that. And that's, you don't really want to, you know, we don't want to deal with any of that. So we use a machine learning approach to identify just the, the plant material itself and, and essentially extract the, the rest of the uh, information we don't want. Um, and then we have a, another system called Plant CV that actually is kind of a wrapper that does all of the analytics. Um, so it handles, it or, or uh, ra as a wrapper, it functions to uh, manage that uh, plant image identification process as well as uh, uh, the rest, the additional analytics. So, for example, uh, measuring the assessing the height of a plant or the droopiness. So, like here, the uh, when a plant's wilted under drought and it's wilting below the the perimeter or the uh, uh, edge of the the pot, the software detects that. And um, this is this software engine provides us with the quantitative measures that we use to assess growth and development and so on. Um, uh, this system is actually uh, uh, it's something that we've now deployed as an open source kind of community resource. Um, so uh, uh, people, you know, anybody in the world can use it. Um, now I'll get into a little bit of how we've actually used this system uh, more experimentally. So we do a lot of work with a grass species called Ceteria viridis. So Ceteria viridis is a, a weed uh, that it's a C4 plant. It's closely related and, and therefore a good model for other C4 grasses. So C4 refers to, if you're not a plant biologist, it refers to a type of photosynthesis. Um, Ceteria is related, related essentially to corn, switchgrass, sugarcane, other C4 plants. So it's a model system. Um, and interestingly, uh, there's the wild uh, plant called Ceteria viridis, which is the, the, what we use as the model. 
But Soteria italica is an actual crop, especially in places like China. It's called foxtail millet. So it's a, it's a cereal crop. And they're effectively the same species. So the ge genomes are sequenced for both of them, and they're very, very similar. Um, they're interfertile, uh, so uh, we can do a lot of interesting genetics with them. And so we've done a series of experiments on the Lemnitex system to not only characterize Ceteria, but also you do take a genetic approach to try to identify traits of interest. And I'll go through a little bit of the data. Um, so uh, one of the really fundamental things we've had to do is kind of benchmark or ground truth the measurements. So when you're doing an image-based analysis, we, we, we want to be able to assess, for example, biomass accumulation, but we're not going to be manually measuring the plants or weighing them, so we have to do that digitally. So the approach we've taken is to associate the, uh, a physical mass or actual mass uh, uh, of the above ground material with uh, pix pixel count. And uh, this slide and the next just shows two different plants. So this is, uh, uh, oh, I guess I skipped something here. So the, a small plant. You know, which, which the data point is circled here in the, on the uh, regression line here, uh, and, and a tall plant. And this, it turns out to have, you know, it's really nice, our, uh, our squared value. So the pixel-based estimate is highly correlated with a, an actual ground truth measurement that gives us confidence moving forward. And one, uh, in the next few slides, I'll show you a little bit of the data we've acquired that's a little more, more interesting. Once we were confident that we could do these kinds of assessments, um, so, for example, we've uh, examined uh, both the, the model Ceteria and the crop Ceteria under drought conditions. So, in this case, plants were either watered, kind of like saturated, well watered, or watered with a third the amount of water, so they're under chronic stress. And not terribly surprisingly, drought reduces the plant biomass. So, the red trace uh, reflects the, the biomass, or the red data points reflects the biomass that accumulates over time under drought conditions. So this is, it's a nice quantification of this physiological effect, but it's not terribly surprising. Um, another way we, uh, we looked at it, though, is <clears throat> if you actually look at the delta of the, the difference in biomass, something interesting uh, pops out, in that the, the model system, uh, uh, the wild relative of the, the crop, really performs poorly uh, uh, in comparison. So there's uh, relatively less biomass accumulates uh, uh, than, than in the wild type over the duration of the experiment. And uh, we've looked into this a little further and we think it actually reflects an interesting property of the domesticated crop plant in that the, the crop plant has just simply better, it's been uh, uh, bred essentially for improved water use efficiency. So the, in, in this case, if you look at the the water use efficiency here defined as the biomass per unit water applied to the plants, the, uh, the model system performs the same, kind of like equally well or equally bad, however you look at it, uh, under drought. But the crop actually, do, it's more water use efficient, uh, sorry, in the red, more water use, use efficient under stress. And that's, that's really an interesting observation, but it's not terribly surprising because you'd expect in you know, over the 10,000 years of, of uh, um, domestication or an improvement in Ceteria or whatever, however many thousands of years, uh, yield stability under varying uh, environmental conditions, including drought, would be selected for. Um, so that's a, a little uh, interesting observation that we made. Um, we've also, I won't get into the details of this, but we've also pursued the genetics a little bit more. Um, what this plot depicts, uh, if you're not familiar with quantitative genetics, is the, the really strong, these peaks of the, with a high LAD score represent a, a strong association of a genotype with a potential a locus on a chromosome that's a, associated with a, or correlated with a trait. And so we've used the Lemnitec data to essentially map uh, some potential new traits associated with, with a, a um, growth under both uh, uh, um, well-watered conditions and, and uh, drought conditions. Um, uh, you, and we've done this uh, using the data. I didn't get into it, but um, from that real collection, there's a slide where I explain that we've, we have a collection of lines that are derived from a cross of uh, Ceteria viridis and Ceteria italica. <clears throat> All right. Uh, um, Another component of, of uh, yield, in particular in the sense of like bio, biomass rather than grain yield per se, is the height of the plant. 
So we did a similar uh, type of uh, gr uh, ground truthing uh, assessment to uh, make sure that we could uh, accurately identify, uh, identify or estimate the height of the plant from the imaging data. And here's, a, here's an example of a short plant uh, on the end and the, the linear regression, a tall plant. Um, the software is able to automatically with, and robustly call plant height. So we've also pursued plant height as a trait. Um, so again, we've looked at the variation under uh, drought and, and, and control wa well water conditions. Um, again, we have this case of uh, the, the Ceteria viridis, the, the wild relative, uh, performs relatively poorly in terms of accumulating height during the experiment under drought conditions, but the crop version of Ceteria performs uh, effectively similarly, so on the right panel. Um, under both drought and, uh, and uh, well water conditions. So it's able to, even under drought, continue accumulating ma biomass in the sense of height and growth. Um, all right, so uh, I've been talking about the controlled environment phenotyping on the Lemnitec system at the Danforth, but we also do, as part of the same project, field studies. Um, so we have a field site that's um, at the University of Illinois, uh, and and we're accessing and using this in the context of a big DOE grant that's described up above. Um, with this picture, just a, is a, a couple times a year, we go and plant Ceteria in the field, and, and then we have separate trips for phenotyping, and you can see it's just a really big crew. Gives you a sense of the labor-intensive nature of doing field phenotyping. Um, we had, at that day, it was about 60 people just to, just to plant the uh, uh, Ceteria seedlings. Um, so uh, anyhow, uh, can move on and explain what the relevance of this field work. So we've done the same kind of studies in the Lemnitec system, in the controlled environment, and in the field. Of course, the conditions are different, but we apply drought in the field, and we try to apply a drought, a simulated drought, in the controlled environment. And what is interesting is we've managed to map uh, a QTL, so this strong peak here on chromosome six, I don't know why this thing's not working too well, um, in both the field and on the Lemnitec. And why this is interesting is this is an example of uh, essentially translation of a trait between controlled environment and the field, which uh, there are relatively few examples, and this is kind of one of the per perpetual issues and problems when, with controlled environment phenotyping is a, a usual typical criticism is, oh, well, what you, will what you find actually translate to the field? And this is, that this phenomenon, I mean, it's, it's a difficult challenge and it's doomed a lot of trait candidates that have been identified in the past. So ag companies have pursued genes that looked great in controlled environments and don't perf perform in the field. So we have at least one example here of a, of a trait that does translate between the, the field and the controlled environment. Okay, so um, just to summarize this section on the high throughput uh, phenotyping in the controlled environment, so we, we've developed an open source so software platform uh, that's, that's available for the community. Um, it was initially developed with the Lemnitec in mind, but we've, at, we've used it with data derived from other platforms as well, so it's, it's pretty much universal. Um, we've done uh, high throughput phenotyping on a number of plant species. I only showed you the data from, uh, from uh, Ceteria, but the system, so long as a plant is less than three feet tall, it works on our, our particular Lemnitec system. Um, this allows unbiased digital quantification of, of a variety of traits associated with growth and development. Um, I didn't show you at all uh, work we've done with fluorescence imaging and, the, and uh, near infrared analysis. So uh, we've um, used the fluorescence imaging to assess photosynthetic efficiency and ha found some really interesting results. So for example, nice variation in photosynthesis in certain cultivars of, of sorghum um, and in, in other systems. Uh, near infrared has been uh, fairly challenging. Uh, we had a lot of actual just uh, kind of mechanical technical problems to get it to work in the first place and now we're trying to figure out the analytics associated with it. Um, so, the, and finally, I'll, I'll just skip down to, we've demonstrated at least one trait that translates between controlled environments in the field. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears now, and well, okay, I, I forgot I had this slide. So, uh, I told you the, the Lemnitec system cost almost $4, $4 million. So that's the all-in cost, including the uh, purpose-built building that it's in, 
and, and the system itself. But we're also investigating alternatives, so really relatively cheap phenotyping alternatives. And one of them uh, is depicted here. Uh, I, it's too early, so I'm not going to show you any data, but what we've set up in a, in a greenhouse is a network of, it's about 20 kind of like their high-end webcams uh, that are uh, looking at the plants growing on the benches from different angles. Every plant is imaged by at least three cameras to allow uh, three-dimensional reconstructions. Um, and this work is a collaboration with Robert Pless. He's a computer scientist at WashU who has done this kind of 3D reconstruction from webcam imaging in, uh, in other contexts. And so we're just getting started with this. The cameras are just recently installed and we're doing the really basic stuff like figuring out, well, how many cameras do you really need given the fields of view to get enough images of all the plants and uh, things like that. Get, figuring out how to deal with the, the data flow because it's effectively streaming. These are, uh, would be like um, security cameras. So they're, they're pretty much doing like video uh, imaging. Um, the, the footprint and the data is, is pretty modest. It's only 30 gigabases a day. I don't know if that, maybe, you know, I would call that sort of, you know, big data. I don't, not, maybe not everyone would consider it that. Um, so this could be, you know, a, a very affordable alternative to a phenotyping system like the Lenatech, but it's really, it's limited to visible imaging. So really interesting spectral information is not, isn't going to fall out of this kind of imaging. All right, so this is where I wanted to switch gears and talk about the, uh, what's going to happen, I think, in the next few years with field phenotyping and the associated big data challenges. So I'll start with, um, I'm sure, well, let's see what's going on here. Okay, there. Uh, a lot of you may be familiar with a new program that was just announced about a month ago um, by DOE. It's called the Terra program. So the DOE ARPA-E program has this vision to develop uh, essentially an end-to-end system uh, uh, answer, response, or solution to the field phenotyping problem to drive to, uh, faster breeding of bioenergy crops. <clears throat> and the, the vision is, this is a, this, I took this cartoon straight out of the, the FOA, um, is uh, the program encompasses everything you see on here from plant genomics and genotyping and, and genetics to uh, new algorithms and computational approaches for image analysis, automated uh, autonomous vehicles for, for field phenotyping, and those are both ground vehicles and aerial platforms. Uh, they have vi a vision for networks of sensors to be placed in, in fields, and, and there's also a controlled environment uh, component. And the whole vision is to take all these disparate technologies that exist in various flavors or forms and assemble an, a, a true system solution to accelerate breeding. And you know, all the technologies in, in one way or another do actually exist. They might need optimization and the prices have to come down, but I think this is a plausible vision. And, uh, you know, like some of the technologies we can just reasonably anticipate are going to be pulled into this RPE or depicted here. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen these kind of makeshift homemade uh, uh, tractor rigs. They're covered in sensors. That's kind of like the uh, uh, generation one of field phenotyping equipment. Other platforms are like here, a, a truly autonomous uh, robot system with no driver. There are gantry systems where this girder system suspends sensors that image uh, the field. The drone area is really hot. I mean, that's an area where it's actually amazing how many companies have commercialized drones at this point. And, uh, and you know, hopefully there's gonna be, I put the question marks, hopefully people will come up with new stuff that you know, we're not even thinking about. Like I saw a proposal from uh, Raytheon for these uh, one liter cube satellites, CubeSats. So the Climate Corp guy, where, Jeff, where is he here? He probably knows all about CubeSats. And you know, I was just fascinated. Imagine having you know, a satellite that's you know, six inches on all sides and it's you know, imaging crops. I mean, it's just, there's amazing technologies that, that might be brought, into, brought to bear here. Um, this is just an example from Lemnitech, this uh, field gantry system that they've actually deployed at a, uh, they've, this is a, car, a computer generated cartoon, but they've actually sold the system in a number of places. And uh, it, uh, what, this gantry that runs on rails actually uh, kind of circumscribes or, or uh, covers up to an acre, uh, which would be sufficient to actually do some breeding. Um, and uh, the gantry system is, 
houses a, a suite of sensors from LIDAR to hyperspectral imaging, various multispectral imaging. Um, so this is a platform that is commercially available, very expensive, but you're getting into the big data realm because this, like, this particular platform generates a terabyte of raw data uh, per day. And if you're using it you know, th 12 months a year, now you're you know, quickly approaching you know, petabyte type scale data sets. Big cha challenges will be coming. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up here with uh, just kind of a summary of what I see as the, the big data challenges uh, coming soon. Um, so uh, there are some really practical problems like data transfer. So for example, if you have, for example, that Lemnitec gantry system and you place it at a remote field site in a rural location and you're streaming a terabyte of data or at least a day, that can be a problem. I've actually looked into it and got quotes on what it costs to run like an extra mile of fiber. To, and it's, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases just to have the data connectivity to even get useful data off one of those platforms in a, in a field situation. So there's really practical data transfer issues. Data storage, so we heard this, I don't remember exactly who, who said it, but brought up this issue of, you know, sometimes it's cheaper to just throw away the raw data and reacquire it, or, you know, this is a debate that's going on in the phenotyping community, is just like happened in the sequencing community. Should we even bother storing the raw data? You know, like terabytes, petabytes of raw data, when you could potentially just redo the experiment? Um, so, you know, question is, how are we gonna archive all of this phenotyping data? Um, there are no data standards um, in phenotyping right now. There, it's just a kind of a wild west of there, uh, whoever, however your images are generated, standard or, or archived, labeled with whatever meta, metadata data. So we need to have community standards. Um, the, there are a variety of computational solutions that, that might exist in one way or another, but haven't really been developed and deployed with plant phenotyping in mind. I've listed a few here. So, for example, algorithms and software platforms for automated processing of the, Im the image data, data compression. Uh, we don't even know yet, like what kind of, uh, what losses are acceptable with the image data coming off of uh, 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 phenotyping platforms. Uh, how do you and w extract digital phenotypes and what, what are those digital phenotypes? That's work that remains to be done. Integrating all the data, so data from the environment, data from uh, of plant genotypes, so like genomics and other omics data sets with the image data. Um, and then we're gonna need improved methods for making the genotype, the really interesting stuff that's supposed to come out of this work, the genotype to phenotype associations and modeling relationships with phenotypes. So for example, like in the, the ARPA eCall, kind of a, a uh, uh, I guess you'd call it like a um, holy grail kind of goal would be to find juvenile traits in the plant, in, in, in a crop like sorghum, that are correlated with terminal yield. And some people are skeptical that those even exist, but nobody actually knows. And we won't know until we look. Um, so modeling relationships and correlations between phenotypes, that's another area that needs to be developed. Um, okay, so I'm gonna end there, I'll just acknowledge, uh, um, so there's my group at the Danforth, um, and the key people who, the, People whose work I showed today are shown in red. Uh, so for example, Doug Bryant's a computer scientist who did a lot of the machine, uh, uh, machine learning work. Malia uh, Gahan and Noah Falgren uh, uh, wrote much of the plant CV platform and actually did a lot of the, the Ceteria experiments. So they physically did the, the plant work. Um, some of their uh, helper or undergrad assistants are, are uh, contributed uh, and then uh, one thing I should note is one of the things we decided to do at the Danforth, <clears throat> essentially the, the first year of experiments on the Lemnitech system were all collaborative. So multiple, so that we could get the most out of the limited data sets, uh, a number of faculty, so they're all listed under collaborators here. We all collaborated to generate data sets that we're sharing and we're using uh, in, our, in various ways. And all this work was funded by multiple, generously funded by multiple agencies including DOE, NSF, USDA, JGI, does a lot of sequencing for us and so on. So I'll, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.